Hi, Simon here from the National Centre for Writing. Before we get into the episode, I wanted to give you the heads up about our new creative writing online courses. This term we have historical fiction, crime fiction, creative non-fiction, script writing, poetry and fiction courses, so there is something for everyone. These courses are co-designed with the University of East Anglia and take place over 12 or 24 weeks, depending on which one you go for. And they're a mixture of exercises, resources, Zoom sessions, and you get personal feedback on your writing from the tutors. The courses begin in January 2022, but places do tend to sell out ahead of time. So if you're interested, don't wait too long. It's a great way to kickstart your writing in the new year. Find out more at nationalcentreforwriting.org dot uk forward slash cwo and now on with the episode you're listening to episode 176 of the writing life podcast from the national center for writing a weekly podcast for anyone who writes I am Simon Jones, and it is the 10th of December 2021 here in Norwich. As we're nearing the end of the year, we're looking towards 2022, and there are already lots of exciting things on the horizon for the National Centre for Writing, from festivals to new courses, both online and at our base in Dragon Hall. One such exciting project is Bengali Stories, a collaboration between us and Norwich's Bengali community to better explore Bengali culture across literature, music, storytelling and translation. It's going to have a special focus on connecting local Bengali children with their heritage and we'll be running it monthly at Dragon Hall all the way through to June 2022. I can't wait to find out more myself and if you want to know when the first event in 2022 takes place do make sure you sign up to our newsletter at nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk. Meanwhile, on the show today, we have a very special guest star in the form of Andy Hamilton. Andy is a comedian, game show panellist, television director, comedy screenwriter, radio dramatist, novelist and actor, and you have probably seen and or heard him on Have I Got News For You, The News Quiz, QI, and I'm Sorry I Haven't A Clue, amongst many others. He's written for television shows including Drop The Dead Donkey and Outnumbered, and is currently working on Kate and Koji for ITV with regular writing partner Guy Jenkin. He's a very busy man. I wanted to talk to Andy about his novels, specifically his latest, Longhand, which is an especially unique book in that the entire thing is handwritten, perfectly reproduced in Andy's original Longhand manuscript. The story is of Malcolm George Galbraith, a Scotsman who is writing a letter to his wife, hence the Longhand format, to explain why he has to leave and never return. The explanation involves a vast, surprising, moving and funny dive into mythology, the details of which I definitely won't be spoiling in this episode. I chatted with Andy about finding a publisher who is willing to reproduce his handwriting, how the unusual form supports and enhances the story being told, and why it's probably a one-off. Okay, let's get straight into that chat. Andy, thanks very much for joining us on the podcast today. Longhand is a really unique book in that it's published in its original handwritten form. And I was wondering, is this a way that you've always written? Have you always written longhand instead of, say, on a computer or a typewriter or via any other means? Yeah, um, pretty much from day one. I started in radio on a very fast turnaround topical program called Weekending, and it was faster for me to write the stuff in my handwriting and give it to someone to type and my typing speed was slow so you know that's what i did um and my the the person i write shows like outnumbered with god jenkin he's the same and he stayed on the same show and i find now that the feel of the pen or the pencil on the paper is part of the process so it's weird it gets me into a sort of place some kind of creative imaginative place whereby so it's actually the physicality is part of the process for me now so so i i've never tried to get my typing speed up i've just um stuck with writing in in longhand and and many decades ago i i had this notion that it would be interesting to write a book in longhand and then it was a question of having the right idea and because this idea the the novel longhand is a letter by a man explaining to his loved one why he has to abandon her it it, it, it felt like a natural fit so um but yeah no i've always i've always written in in handwriting and my handwriting's always been fairly neat 
so yeah i'm uh, so i don't think i'll learn to type now i think i've left it too late <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm the polar opposite in that my handwriting is terrible to the point that even i can't read it half the time and uh, my typing is quite fast but i think that's the thing isn't it your brain i think tunes into whatever you do so that when you you know you pick up a pen i go to a, a keyboard and your yeah. brain kind of settles into the mood of what you're about to do that's right yeah yeah it's a, it's just a signal isn't it to your brain to get into a certain mode but um yeah my mode only happens if i've got a, a pencil in my hand yeah yeah. And you've mentioned already that, you know, Longhand, the book, is a, a letter written from one person to another. Um, but what was it What was it about this particular story that, that made it such a good fit for being published in this way? Well, I suppose, um, without giving too much away, it, it, it's a kind of intimate um, of, of quite an epic story. The, the hero, the narrator of the letter, the writer of the letter is an extraordinary man with a, a fantastic past, I mean, um, fantastic in, in sort of both senses of the word. And um, the, the main thing was I thought the intimacy of it, the, the directness of talking to someone that you've abandoned, I thought that, you know, where there was clearly a, a lot of love in the relationship, I just thought that that would suit a, a handwritten story. And it is quite interesting, I mean, we are we are so used to reading you know type but we read handwriting in a slightly different way you know your 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 eyes sort of scans type uh, type in a way that it doesn't it sort of um photographs it you know in chunks i think whereas when you read handwriting you you, you actually do read left to right you know you read progressively and uh, change some of the rhythms of the writing as well i just thought it that the story was big enough and interesting enough to be shrunk down to an intimate level by the handwriting and i'd had the handwriting idea for decades and i'd had this story knocking around in the back of my head and for a long time and it it contains lots of different elements it can it, there's mythology there's there's it's set on sort of two parallel timelines and it means that his story encompasses all the big stories that humanity has told itself over the centuries about about love about god um you know and there's war and there's battles and lions and yeah there's something about the scale of it i just thought would be miniaturized in an interesting way it i mean i'm, I'm really pleased with it really proud of it and and what's doubly pleasing is that we're pretty sure it's the first work of adult fiction that's been printed in manuscript for, well, I don't know, since, since Caxton put all those poor monks out of work. <laughs> way back. Yes, presumably Unbound didn't hire a load of monks to actually do this one. No, no, that's all me. It's my, my handwriting. Um, and I actually found it, and this is an odd thing, I thought it would be a bit laborious, you know, writing it out in longhand. But actually, I found it oddly therapeutic. You know, if at the end of a day I'd done 20 pages in manuscript, I felt strangely calm. You know, I had a bit of a backache, but I <laughs> did feel quite, quite uh, mellow. And um, I think that must have been just the repetitive action of the, the handwriting, you know. Yeah. As you were writing it, did you already know that, uh, this was how it would be published because it must have been an unusual feeling in that ordinarily you'd be writing something knowing that at some point someone's going to type it up whereas with this one the yeah. thing you were writing was the thing yeah exactly it is the artifact yeah no I was hugely conscious of that um, and I had to make certain choices you know like he is writing this this account of his life in a letter in the form of a letter but he's writing it at, at great speed against the horrible deadline that he's facing so I had to make the choice that if I made a mistake, you know, I, I he wouldn't have gone back to write the whole page out again. So so there are crossings out. Um, and in, in a couple of places, the, the, the crossings out are part of the story because they tell you his state of mind. So when he's losing his, um, his composure, when he's getting upset, you know, the, the handwriting becomes noticeably um, more... There's more crossing out and more uh, corrections, and that was inspired by um, 
I was at the British Library and I, I saw a letter that Queen Elizabeth I wrote to her courtiers explaining that if it was all the same to them, she felt she should decide whether she marries or not. And the letter starts off, she starts off in beautiful copper plate. And then as the letter proceeds, it gets more and more erratic <laughs> and she's crossing stuff out and she ends up writing angrily up the margin, you know. And um, I just thought, I saw that and I thought, well, yeah, actually sometimes the handwriting itself is a, is part of the story, you know, a bit like um, Guy Fawkes' signature. You know that story? No, no, what's that? Guy Fawkes' signature is is nothing like his original signature, but, of course, he'd been tortured, you know, the so signature on his confession is um, this awful, feeble squiggle, you know, and, it, I mean, so... Um, but it was it was to, to answer your question. Yeah, I was acutely conscious that I was producing the artifact. So, you know, I was determined to to keep the lines straight and and stuff like that. You know, uh, and to make it. You know, I mean, it is pretty. The writing is pretty neat. You know, like like any handwriting. You know, if you receive a letter from someone you don't know, it takes you a couple of pages to tune into their handwriting. But once you're in, you know, you're you're in. You know. Yeah, no. One of the things I really love about it is, is like you say, the way the the writing and you know the number of crossings out and that kind of thing alters and informs the character as you go. And of course, that's a level of insight into the character that you just yeah. don't get with a traditionally published book. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, sometimes I was able to show the choice he made, like the word he crosses out and the one he chooses to replace it with. You know, there are a few crossings out where I left it so that you could see what he had written before he crossed it out. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that I've never got to do in any, you know, I've never got to indicate a choice a narrator makes in that way. You know, that was really interesting. And yeah, it makes, it makes the letter around the book feel very immediate. Like it, it feels like Malcolm you know, has just written this thing and you've, yeah. you've got, you've got hold of it. And it feels, you know, it's almost slightly uh, like you're intruding. Cause obviously he wrote this for his yes, wife. For her. Um, yeah, that's that's. <laughs> I would say this, wouldn't I? But that is intentional. Yeah, <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, that feeling of it having just been written is that. It, like, how true is that? I suppose. Like, is was this a, a first draft kind of thing, or did it go through multiple drafts, and you kind of had to work to retain that sense of of uh, it just being crafted? I think there are very few pages that I, you know, that ha I didn't go back over and write a new page on a pass you know so there were there was more than one pass but um but i sort of did it in segments and broke it down and i did quite a lot of walking around with it in my once i'd done the first draft i did quite a long period of walking around just mulching it down mm. in my head so when i came to do the second draft i was pretty confident about where i was going but um i mean that's that's a luxury that as a writer, you don't necessarily get that often, you know, the, uh, the chance to just let something organically settle down in your mind, you know, because sometimes often you're under delivery pressures, you know, but um, I was able to do that. Yeah. So, and that made a huge difference. I found. Presumably that's quite so different I, to your kind of radio and TV work where you will always yeah. have some looming deadline. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way I kind of, by the time I sat down to do the final pass, I kind of knew it almost like an actor learning a part. I'm, you know, they carry the script around with them and it, they look at it and it sort of seeps in through osmosis. Um, that's how a lot of actors learn their parts. Yeah. And presumably you know, in, in that second draft and any revisions you made, part of the challenge would be not making it too polished because it still has to feel like a spontaneous yeah. letter. Yeah. Yes, that's right. No, um, no, but that sort of happened naturally because, you know, the, the kind of natural mistakes. And, yeah, I mean, in places I, I did rough it up a bit, you know, just to, to get that feeling of haste. Yeah, and uh, it's such a t delightful mix of, like, the mundane and mythology and how these two things are, are colliding uh, due to Malcolm's history and his you know, current situation. Um and I was wondering, you know, in terms of the structure of the book, because, you know, it's it's heavily kind of flashback oriented and it's this little puzzle that slowly comes into focus over time. And how much of that 
did you have sort of planned out ahead of time versus you know just kind of finding it as you were writing it well i don't know and i mean this is always in longer form stuff like in a novel or say you were lucky enough to get to be given like six one hours to write you know there's that weird thing where you know you do have a structure you, you and you you probably know roughly where you're going to end up but you find you find yourself going down sort of routes and byways that you you hadn't necessarily planned but that feel right in the moment but i did um particularly in i mean you know god appears in the story on on more than one occasion and and in those things i found i was sort of letting it happen a bit more than uh, i might normally do in terms of the dialogue um and his sort of capricious personality so it's a bit of both really it's a slightly mealy mouth dancer but um <laughs> yeah i thought a lot about the structure but but particularly particularly in the middle of the book um it it it, it, it took on a life of its own as well which i suppose it, it, that's sort of the ideal world that you want isn't it you want um you want a structure to hang things on but you want moments of intuitive storytelling to happen in the middle of that yeah no, absolutely and and you know particularly in something like this where it has to retain that that spontaneity and mm. that, that feeling of of Malcolm only just discovering what he's going to write as he's writing it yeah yeah i mean i what well, the other interesting thing was of course the outside world keeps banging on his door he's trying to write this letter and and the real world just keeps uh delaying him and impeding him and obstructing him so I found that a couple of a couple of the interventions of the outside world were just sort of happened in the moment, if you know what I mean. So mm. that was, um, yeah. And you're right; that is quite a different experience to certainly to writing sort of half hour sitcom or something like that. Yeah. No, the, the interruptions uh, are interesting actually. Now that you mention it, because even most kind of first person narrations, uh, and even when it's you know supposed to be a diary or something that the character has written you know ordinarily you, d- you don't get a sense of sort of when they wrote it <laughs> or, or how they got yeah. around to doing it whereas that's a very much a part of the story in longhand yes the fact that he's hiding away up in the loft trying to get it done without his partner knowing about it and then you know and then he's interrupted by all sorts of uh, some emergencies some trivial piddly things yeah that that, that sort of helps the, the sense of it being written in real time, I think. You've also had this amazing career in radio and TV, which you know, most listeners will be familiar with that work. And your, I think your first novel, Star Witness, came out in 2016. And yeah. now we have Longhand as well. And I was wondering, what was it about, you know, the last, what, what's that, six years or so, what was it about this period that moved you towards writing novels in addition to all the other projects that you have? Uh, I don't know. I suppose it was something I always wanted to do. Um, but obviously you've got to carve out quite a chunky, substantial um, amount of time to do it properly. Um, so, you know, I've got, you know, upstairs, I've got a drawer full of um, novels where I got to about page 35. <laughs> Like like a lot of people, I'm sure I'm sure that's the guilty secret that you'll find in most writers' houses. And uh, I just thought, eventually, I thought I'm just going to have to sort of glue my ass to the seat and and actually do one. So, like Star Witness again, that story had been knocking about in my head for a long time. And initially, I'd done it as a play, but it didn't quite work as a play. Um, it was too neat, if you know what I mean, as a play. Mm-hmm. And I wanted it to be a, a little bit truer to life, a bit more untidy. I suppose I wrote it as soon as I could, Simon. I think it's the it, it, honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's lovely, you know. Writing in long form is is lovely because of the freedom it gives you, you know. Suddenly, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to write more. Um, and writing in prose is so interesting because the choices are so so many, you know. So so infinite i mean you know that's true of all writing you know to a certain extent but in prose particularly narrative prose you know the the choices are the elasticity of the prose is fascinating you know yeah it's presumably required quite a shift from 
the material that you you were used to writing yeah i mean i'm a you know most of my work you know is is done in dialogue yeah um whether it's on radio or tv so so you know i'm I'm sort of in my comfort zone when i'm writing dialogue mm. uh, and character through dialogue but actually um prose particularly descriptive prose where the line between i think the line in descriptive prose is such a fine line between something that is um, evocative and then something that is too rich and gushy. <laughs> um, you know, that that's really interesting and um, tone and um, uh, rhythm uh, in the prose. Um, I mean, it is endlessly intriguing, you know, so I really enjoyed that aspect of it. You know, Yeah. How does it compare? Because you know, most of your other projects, you are writing, say, a script that will then be interpreted multiple times by actors, directors, editors before it ends up as the finished article. Whereas when you're writing prose for a novel, uh, the the thing that you write uh, is is the end product, really. Um, and you know, even if it goes yeah. through editors and publishers, it, it's far it's less of a team effort, I suppose. Um, what, what was it like, kind of shifting into that mode? Well. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love making, I love the collaborative side of TV and radio, um, you know, or theatre. I mean, it, that's fantastic. But you, as you rightly say, you know, you, you, you have to do it in collaboration. So there's lots of interpretive elements and the, the dialogue is, the characters are brought to life by actors, which at one level is, is wonderful. Um, but, um, and of course, I mean, the way my career has evolved, I've managed to, um, sort of feed the control freak in me by, you know, because I'm at the uh, I'm at the shooting of it and I and I'm at the editing as well. So, you know, I, I keep control of as a huge amount of it in that sense. But it is nice to sometimes just sit down and think, right, what I write is that's going to be it. You know, I mean, radio is a little bit like that in that it's just you. And the microphone, there's there's not all the layers of um, departments that you get in TV that can all influence it, you know. Because in TV, if it's filmed the wrong way or if it's lit the wrong way or it's recorded the wrong way, it, it, the, the piece can get damaged. In radio, it's a, it's a much shorter production line, you know. And um, I enjoyed it as a kind of antidote to what I normally do if that makes sense <laughs> yes yeah and with, uh, with both your books you published them through Unbound and I was wondering mm -hmm. what led you to them in particular and I think especially with Longhand did that give you you know the, the, the flexibility you needed to publish it in this form so what what attracted me to Unbound as a publisher was that the business model that they've created gives them um it gives them an appealing uh, creative madness in a way in that they um, usually when you pitch an idea to a publisher, you know that they're sitting there thinking, how how much money could I lose uh, publishing this bloke's idea? Whereas their model is because they raise money from pledges from people who who would like to buy the book or would like uh, to invest in the production of the book. So until you meet your production costs, the book doesn't get the green light so so in a way that gives them um uh, much more license to go for slightly mad off the wall ideas because unless uh, unless enough people think that that's an interesting off the wall mad idea to um to fund the, the production of it then it, it then it won't happen and so i think that's you know as a writer that's what's appealing because you know, one sits in so many meetings where someone with round shoulders tells you, oh, no, you know, we've tried that. Someone, you know, that won't work. You know, there's no market for that is the classic comeback, of course. And, and this model frees you from all that, you know. I mean, it has, you know, there are, there are downsides in that they don't have the scale of the big publishers. You know, they don't have the huge um, sort of distribution engines and stuff, but they... But they, it's a writer-friendly environment, I think. 
no, definitely. That's, that's certainly what we've we've heard uh, from other writers as well. And yeah, it's almost like they've they've created a, a, a much lower risk model that then lets them actually take a lot more creative risks, <laughs> which is clever. Yes, yes, that is clever. Yeah. I, I mean, even even with them, was there any hesitancy or concerns on their part about publishing it in in the handwritten form? No, I mean, I showed them like 30 pages of what it would look like, roughly. Uh, well, if there was any hesitancy, they didn't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, John Mitchison loved the idea, and um, I don't know how hard he had to work on his colleagues, but they did a very good job on it. You know, the, the graphic design people did a really good job on it, of, um, you know, because you get things like consistency in the ink because the ink dries out when you're writing and stuff like that, and they... They smoothed it all out very nicely, you know. So, um, no, I was really pleased with what they did. Yeah. What was what was the practical process? So, did you send off your your original pages, and then they, they did some technical wizardry there? And how did they actually put it? Yeah. Off? No, I delivered the manuscript, the completed manuscript, on the day that they were packing up the office uh, in March 2020 to lockdown. Oh, wow, yeah. And that was put away in the safe. And then it was given to the graphic design people to to sort of go through it and uh, and just give it a bit of an iron, um, and uh, um, you know, so things they've done are subtle, but but I noticed them. Yeah, I mean, it was in a. I mean, I, I, I don't fully understand the process, but it's just a form of scanning, basically. I think. Yeah, um, and you you mentioned just then that you know, the, the book from your end was was ready just as covid hit everything yeah. um did, did that yeah. impact on the publication of the book from memory yes we the publication date went back slightly it still came out at a time when the bookshops weren't open mm. so that wasn't great and also you know there was a period where none of the festivals happened you know so it you know that was a challenge it's been a challenge in terms of promoting it and getting that kind of momentum, you know, but, um, but then tens of thousands of people have been in the same boat, you know, so it wasn't ideal, but, you know, at least it got done. Yes. Yeah, exactly. No, we, we, we've spoken to a lot of writers who have had varying stories of difficulties and I think one person had their publication delayed to avoid the lockdown and then it ended up coming out just as the second lockdown started. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in TV, it's the same. And film, you know, something often you've been forced to delay. But when do you, when do you delay to? Mm. You know, the, the, it's there. You know, I think you just have to accept the uncertainty and um, accept that you know there are going to be lots of things you can't control, mm -hmm. and just try not try not to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I suppose in some ways, you know, novel writers at least can just write from home and you don't have the complications of how do we how do we get a team in the same room together and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah no i mean i had to postpone um we had to postpone a, a tv series because we would it would have involved taking 60 people to elstree studios every day uh, at a time when you know one in 30 londoners were infected with covid now obviously that it became evident that that was both unmanageable and sort of irresponsible, so we we postponed. But um, but we're due to do it this January coming, when it's possible there's going to be another wave then. You know, so we just have to accept it. Yeah, and hope for the best. Yeah, just muddle through. I think that's what everyone's trying to do, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So now now that longhand exists, and you know, you mentioned that this was an idea that's been kind of bouncing around in your head for for many years and and now the book exists it's happened does that kind of scratch the itch or do you are you intrigued enough by by the notion of a, a handwritten published book to to do it again in a different way i don't know I, i'm nervous about trying to do anything else handwritten because i don't want to detract from the the uniqueness of it you know mm. what i mean that both both as a, a book and as a kind of thing an artifact you know I've, I've done a few interviews where people have said things to the effect of oh it's such a nice thing <laughs> you know <laughs> um and you know obviously if i bring out another one then then they start to feel a bit sort of to a penny but um also i don't know i mean experience tells me you know if you can 
don't I mean obviously in telly you end up you have to do more than one series because uh because of it, partly because of the economics of it but um I yeah I, I I'm not sure I'd do another handwritten one maybe maybe in 10 years time when I've had another idea <laughs> uh, yes um but um at the moment no I, yeah. I, that that itch has been scratched yeah <laughs> um so so what is next you mentioned there's some tv projects uh, coming up do, do are you working on another novel um yeah well yes but not um it's not in a state yet where i can show it to anybody i've got a couple i've got two on the go mm -hmm. and they've both kind of frozen at about 35 pages <laughs> <laughs> go in the drawer uh, with us. <laughs> and i don't know which one we might eventually uh, i'll get depends on whether there's another lockdown i suppose in telly i'm doing uh, a second series of a sitcom i did with brenda bletting on itv called kate and koji with guy jenkin who's i've written i've co-written lots of stuff with for the last 40 years and then we've kind of we are currently working on this mental idea, which is um, a satire on the World Cup, a bit like sort of Team America. Did you see Team America? Yes, yeah. Yeah, a bit like that, um, only using little plastic toy figurines. So it's an animation about the World Cup using toy footballers, which is completely daft because neither of us have made any animation. I mean, I've voiced animation but mm. neither of us made any um so we're doing that with a um, you know a reputable animation house and we're making a sample yeah. and and the sample we will send the sample to broadcasters and and you know because the biggest problem for them would be well what the hell would it look like so at least we can show them the sample and we'll give them a bit of script as well and so that would be great if we got away because it's again so such a different thing to do yeah, yeah, and you wouldn't have to worry about uh, as many COVID rules either with uh, small toys. No, that's true. We would not have to uh, do lateral flow tests on them <laughs> um, and, and impose lots of restrictions on them. Yeah, no, that would be good. Fantastic. Well, lots to look forward to there. And uh, yeah, Longhand is is available now and yeah, absolutely yeah. worth checking out because yeah, like you say, there's not really anything else quite like it. No, it's available in paperback and hardback now. Yeah. Started off in nursing paperback. Fantastic. Well, Andy, thanks so much for your time this morning. That's a fascinating insight into a really unique project. And yeah, really appreciate all the, all the insight there. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, it, was, it was a pleasure. Thank you for listening. And many thanks to Andy for coming on the show. If you have questions or want to get in touch with us, you can find us basically everywhere. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Writer Centre. We have a Facebook page. And of course, our website is at nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk where you can sign up to the newsletter, join our amazing Discord community of lovely writers and find out more about everything that is coming up. As a UK registered charity, we do rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible, including this podcast. You can make a donation over on the website by heading to the Support Us page. Please do subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes and leave us a review if your app happens to support that feature. Thanks again, do keep writing and I'll catch you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.